So now let me introduce today's speaker. Terry Griffith is a professor of management at Santa Clara University School of Business. She's an expert on combining technology, organizational decision making, and change. Terry earned her doctoral and master's, master's degree in organizational psychology with minors in technology from Carnegie Mellon University. She's a regular contributor to a number of blogs and several respected journals, and most recently published a book on the topic of plugged in managers, which you can actually get in our lobby. So right after this, we'll have networking for about a half an hour. And so if you'd like to mingle with the speaker, ask questions based on today's talk, buy copies of the book, eat some food, please do um, hang out with us afterward because we moved it based on um, popular survey feedback. Um, finally, Terry also happens to be a t-shirt award-winning sailor, um, and she placed second in the pink boat race raising money for breast cancer, which is actually pretty great. So let's welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to trigger indiscreet questions. I think that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> well, first of all, yes, I am a frequent attendee here at the Park Forum, and that's usually my spot right over there. And I sit there and I tweet away. So this is going to be a little bit strange for me, and I hope someone's going to pick up the slack. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here amongst friends, colleagues, and people I hope that are going to become friends and colleagues in that fine reception area afterwards. So thank you very much. As I said, I am a frequent attendee, and I do blog about uh, being here. And so as I was thinking about the Park Forum and Park, it occurred to me that Park itself is a great example of plugged-in management. And I started to think about how I could actually explain that. Well, if you were at Eric Reese's talk, or Bob Sutton's talk, or Teresa Mobile, I think I was sitting right there, that's why the image is a little bit more centered. Uh, Teresa Mobile talking about the progress principle and creativity, or John Hagel's talk, who was kind enough to write the foreword to my book, or Nilifer Merchant's uh, talk here on subversive collabor collaborators. And I think she got the best image out of this. <laughs> It's absolutely wonderful. All of those presenters I would classify as plugged in managers, plugged in analysts, plugged in authors because they all think about the technology piece in some way, shape, or form, the people piece of it, you know, how human attributes weigh in our decision making, and then how organizations end up being put together in a way that makes us be more effective. And so to me, the fact that these are the kinds of people that get invited to speak and stand up in here uh, in front of you says to me that the park organization, the park forum, is a plugged in space, that it's looking for that kind of integration that I'll be talking about tonight. And in, as I thought about why the why of plugged in management and why I wrote the book, it was because I actually feel pain when I see things that aren't plugged in, things that are of a single dimension and then aren't working as well as they might because of that. And instead, I feel great joy. You know, if I think about an iPhone, why is an iPhone great? It's not great because it's a pretty piece of technology. It's great because of its integration, how it integrates with the music we want, the apps we want, the things we want to do as people, and then the technology works effectively too. So, that's why I was writing this book, and it leads me to kind of want to play a little game with you guys. Because Mark Zuckerberg, if we believe Wikipedia, if we believe the Facebook movie, the social network, used to like to play this game called Hot or Not. Now, when he played Hot or Not, he played it with co-eds, you know, looking at the girls. When I play Hot or Not, and I do, I play it thinking about technologies and organizations. And so let's kick this off a little bit. This is an MRI, hot or not? Going hot? Okay, hot. All right. This is an open-sided MRI, hotter. And what's a little bit interesting to me about this is in 1995, when I was first thinking about MRIs and where they fit in all of this, the folks who were bringing up this technology and were talking about the technology and its uses were saying things like people who have claustrophobia with a 30-inch tube, people who don't fit in a 30-inch tube, not such a big deal. Well, it's not such a big deal, really, gave rise to an entire split off of the technology, which at least in 1995 wasn't as technically good, the imaging wasn't as good, but the trade-offs around the human characteristics of it made it be actually a worthwhile switch. 
the service you receive from Zappos. Hot? How about the VIP people? You always get your stuff the next day. That's pretty impressive, right? They organize everything about providing wow service. So early in their development, they said, we're going to be about service. Well, it isn't just about how they treat you on the phone. They built their fulfillment center in Kentucky next to the UPS hub to make sure that they can get this stuff to you the next day. That's a significant integration of organization, people, and technology. How about the service you receive when you go to the airport? Yeah, not, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Now, that one, they're focused on security. Are they focused on anything else? Yeah, not, not that I've been able to figure out. I'm actually digging <laughs> deeper into this case because I want to know a little bit more about it when I, when I talk about it. But I'll come back to this picture in a minute. Southwest Airlines. Yeah, I'm getting some thumbs up there. Now, what impressed me the most about them is their flying public is not entirely made up of the business traveler. They have a huge proportion of their flying public who don't fly except maybe once a year or once every several years. Going to the airport is a big deal. And yet, they were able to make a major transition in terms of how they board people, and I think for the better versus their older strategies, a major transition in terms of how they board people, even keeping in mind that these are folks who are very infrequent flyers. This is New Core Steel. Largest steel company in the U.S. right now, also the largest U.S. recycler. Now, the thing that makes them hot to me, besides the fact that that's molten steel, is uh, they have four layers of management. Four, period. The largest U.S. steel maker. They're all over. They also have plants uh, around the world. Accountability and you know, empowerment is really how they pull this off. But it's all about safety. It's all about technology innovation. Very interesting pay systems, team-based pay for the most part, four layers of management. So I'm going to go with them having found great ways to make appropriate trade-offs. And that brings me to the, the why. You know, why is it that these are interesting issues? Well, they're interesting issues to me because each of the hot examples are cases where they somehow figured out how to take human characteristics, human abilities, things that people like, organizational process, and technology tools, and mix them together in a way that's working. So like those park speakers I mentioned, like these organizations, they've been able to do that in a very interesting way. And so from the, the subtitle of the book is get in tune with your people, technology, and organization to thrive. And, you know, we've been thinking about these things since the 1950s. You know, I'm a professor at Santa Clara. We think about a lot of things that have been going on for a long time. We're the oldest university west of the Mississippi or something like that, certainly the oldest in California. So we think about historical events. Going back to the 1950s, we've been thinking about this mix of people, technology, and organizational process. Part of the problem is the term we use, socio-technical systems, now, some of you, I'm sure, know about socio-technical systems. I bet you don't use it in daily dinner conversation. I bet you're not going to go up to a Southwest customer and say, we did this because of the socio-technical benefits. We're not going to do that. So they did not have a hot term. And as a result, it hasn't gained a lot of use. So my colleagues and I, in thinking about these ideas, really wanted to bring them to a broader audience and to find a way to help folks get them involved in daily management. I'm also guessing most of the people in this room, especially given that we're here at Park, where we think about technology design a lot, haven't been focused on a silver bullet strategy. That you don't think, if I just hire this one person. You know, when they talk about the CEO changes we've seen in the Valley recently, one person isn't going to change the outcomes for these organizations. So I bet most of the folks in this room aren't thinking about one person. I bet you're not thinking about, if I just had this one technology, everything would be different. It's also the case that any one organizational system change isn't going to make a big difference. It's going to be some way of mixing these things together in a way that makes sense for the particular situation that are going to give us the benefits that we're looking for. So 
I'm going to say that silver bullet strategies didn't work in the 50s, and they certainly don't work now. So the who, the who is the interesting question. And so a lot of the time we started off with, well, you guys were able to do the hot or not. You were basically saying, which are the organizations that are actually plugged in? We know it when we see it. But that isn't quite good enough, and especially not if what we want to do is be able to figure out who are the people who are most plugged in, how can we put them in some place of influence where they can organize teams effectively, who are the people who are most, middle, or least plugged in so that we can arrange for different levels of training, who are these folks and how many of them do we need to really have a good chance of organizational success. And so it was about how do we measure this? How do we define it tightly enough? How do we measure it? How do we find these people? So for that piece of the work, these are my colleagues, and I want to be sure to give them great credit. I've given this in order of uh, the order that we came to the project. But you can see we come from a diverse set of organizations, Santa Clara University, Illinois, and that's the supercomputer center there, and then John Sawyer at the University of Delaware. The supercomputer people are interested because they want to know if being plugged, is in, being plugged in is important, how can we design technologies that will help people both learn to be plugged in, but will also adapt to the level of plugged inness that people have? And in the academic world, we call it system savvy. So if you're trying to look up uh, the, the academic work on it, it would come under that title. But we've been working for a while in terms of nailing down a test. And so some of the results I'll share with you today come from these tests. A situational judgment test has been shown to be a very effective way of measuring tacit knowledge. And Robert Sternberg is a psychologist who's sort of the father of being able to measure tacit knowledge. And what he found was if you create scenarios, you go to experts, you go to the people where you say, yeah, I know you're that. I don't know exactly why you're plugged in. I don't know why you have this tacit knowledge, but I know you do. Your peers say you do. And you get them to tell you examples to say, tell me about a time when you had to manage with people, technology, and organizational process all at the same time, but you did it in a way that you couldn't have learned in a book. And then they tell you a story. So that's where my examples come from. That's where the examples in the book started out. And so it, it, in the book, we probably had access to about 15 of these scenarios. And you take those scenarios and you start to look at how did the people who told you about it actually act in that situation? How do other experts think they should act in that situation? And then how do novices act in that situation? And the differences in their answers is how we identify high levels of plugged in skills and lower levels. So to kind of walk you through the process, I do interviews. And so please, when we, when we close tonight, if you have an example where you say, you know, I think this person is plugged in, or this company seems to have a lot of folks like you're talking about, please tell me about them, because I'm still, still looking for new ones. So we do these interviews. They tell me at least one story, often several. They give me the answer that they did. They sometimes will tell me what they also considered and why they chose not to do that thing. We then go to focus groups of more people who've been identified as being plugged in, and we give them the scenario, and we say, what else could someone have done? What do you think an expert would do? What do you think a novice would do? And so we end up with these different outcome possibilities. The last step is then we get a bunch of experts and a bunch of novices. This is very long-term work. A bunch of experts and a bunch of novices, and we have them answer the questions. They rate them for this, and I'm going to show you one in a second. And then we create, through statistical processes, a weighted answer for each one of them. So they don't end up just, you know, this one's the right answer, this one's the wrong answer. They end up with these different weightings. Now, this is for me to read, not for you. All right? Uh, so, and this is, uh, the top part of it is the part that appears in the book. The bottom section has been updated because we're continuing to refine the work. So you're a professional management consultant. A good friend of yours has taken a new management job at a major bank. The 350 employees in her group do back office processing for loan materials, which is not going well. 
Mistakes have been made, and conversations with salespeople who originate the paperwork often result in yelling. So again, this is a real story. I didn't make this stuff up. The bank is about to adopt a multi-million dollar workflow technology to automate some of this process, so your friend has called you for advice. Her perception is there is no creativity or motivation in the bank, and she jokes that she'd like to fire all the employees. But HR won't let her. Please rank each action from one most effective to improving the loan processing activity to five, least effective. And then I'll go through the, some of the possibilities here in a second. So I have, I think we're using seven of these stories right now. So it takes people 20 to 30 minutes to, to walk through them, but they tell me that it's fun. They tell me this is a good thing to be doing. Now, this is the, the results that appear in the book. And as I said, you know, we continue to gather the results, and they're available on the web. Um, at the time, we still had the fire everybody answer. That's the one on the far left. The good news is not anybody thought that was a very good idea. So that's a, a great thing. Uh, the general population, the novices, are in the red bars. And the plugged-in managers, people who'd wit identified, or managers had identified their colleagues that they said were plugged in, are the blue bars. And what we do is we look for the ones where there are the most differences. So this one says, uh, implement and train these folks based on kind of best practices. And that's the one that the plugged in managers say is the best. And it shows a, a larger difference with the general population of the novices. The actual answer the person did who was telling me the story was they put the whole thing on hold, they gave training to both the salespeople and the back office people, and then they had them redesign it. And the ultimate result was that they didn't implement the technology. They stayed with what they were doing. And I love that story because it says technology is not the answer. It's how do you mix the technology in with the process that you have and everything else. Um, the answer that the general population versus the most plugged in people. This one's one of the larger differences was, we'll add five people to the team who've already done it before. And what that one is, is that one's an organizational silver bullet. So neither an organizational silver bullet nor a technology silver bullet is really the right answer. It's really some combination of both of them. The other thing we've discovered from doing these scenarios and listening to people's answers, the most plugged in folks are also the most comfortable with what we call emerging answers, answers that don't have a finish point. Well, I'm going to train these folks. I'm going to give them a budget to think about the new technology, but I'm going to let them decide. And we're very interested for kind of the second level of the research as to why that's true. But we think that. It, it's the case that they, they have enough expertise that if something starts to go wrong, they're going to know it, and they're going to feel comfortable with stepping in. But in the meantime, they're willing to let other people just sort of move along. So as we gathered the work, what we've seen is the stories point to the things that individuals do in their job. It points to the things managers do in their job. And it also points to entire organizations and how the organization acts as a whole. That was an interesting point for us. So it wasn't just about me and my work, so I'm plugged in. It wasn't just about a manager and how he or she managed her group. And it wasn't either that whole organizations had to have this. It's that it can appear at any of those three levels. We were also surprised to find out that it could be about the work. It could be about team organization or it could be about organization design more generally. So it seems to be quite generalizable. And I want to go through a deep story to kind of lay this all out. And this is Providence Regional Medical Center in Everett, Washington. I'm going, who would have thought that this regional medical center up in Everett, Washington would become this great example? But they've been written up in Business Week as being very effective medically. And someone wrote to me and said, you really need to check these people out. I think they're what you're talking about. And they were kind enough to talk with me. Their chief nursing officer put me in touch with Nurse Judy. Now, Nurse Judy had worked at this cardiac critical care center for a very long time, very good at her job, high skill levels. 
And she said that, you know, they had always been good at what they do. But she kept noticing that, you know, people would come in for scheduled cardiac uh, care. So you might be having a bypass, you might be having a scheduled stent implant or something like that. These folks would come in, they would have their procedure, they would go back to their room, and they would be in the critical cardiac critical care unit. They would go back to their room, spend the night. The night staff nurse would get the person up in the morning, get them kind of, you know, ready to be transferred to what they call the step-down unit. They would put them in the recliner. Now, this is not the Everett Washington example, but it's similar to what they had. So they would move them from the bed, put them into the recliner, and there they would wait for the transport person to come to take them down to the step-down unit. But this is a busy place, and sometimes it could take four to six hours. Can you imagine? I, I, I hope you haven't had that situation, but just imagining sitting there waiting, all the other hassles of being in a hospital, and Nurse Judy is looking at this, going, this, there's got to be a better way. So she goes to the head surgeon. And this surgeon, contrary to all stereotypes around surgeons, says, well, Nurse Judy, what do you think we should do? Yeah, <laughs> it's, got, it's, it's shocked me for sure. So she says, well, let me, let me think about it. He thought about it. The chief nursing officer thought about it. They're all thinking about it. They find two other hospitals to go visit. Now, these are not cardiac care units, but they're very interesting places. And they go to visit them because they had single-stay facilities where instead of staying in this room before your surgery, after your surgery, but then being transferred to the step-down unit for the rehabilitative care, you would just stay in the place. And the technology would come to you, the caregivers would come to you, and it's better for the family. Because one of the scariest things in my experience with hospitals is you show up and you're looking for your loved one and they're not there. That's never been a good experience for me. So in this case of a single stay, family knows where the person is. The nurses know where the person is. The nurses get to know the person over a couple of days. And what happened at this hospital is after they got back from their two field trips, the surgeons, the nursing staff, the other folks met with the hospital administration, and they said, we'll give you two rooms. You can test this out for a few months. They do statistical analyses of how are the patients doing in these two rooms. They got uh, new technologies, so portable x-rays. They brought therapeutic tools up to the floor that they had had down in the step-down unit. The nurses took new training because they were critical care nurses. They didn't know about rehabilitative um, the breath exercises that people have to do. So they, they learned about that. They changed the shift schedules, so no longer three shifts, but instead two. And overall, huge success, huge success. By the time they were done with this thing and it implemented it throughout the unit, so they went all single stay, they were getting people out of there 12 hours faster. And people say, 12 hours, so what? What's the big deal? If you've been in that setting, 12 hours is a lot of blood pressure, wake-ups, it's a lot of hospital meals, it's a lot of hassle and poking and prodding. I would prefer to be home for those 12 hours. Their satisfaction scores are 99%. Now, again, a lot of technology stuff, portable gear, training issues, so the organizational piece, the people piece, it was better for the patients, better for the nurses, better for the families. Another technology piece, they couldn't have pulled this off if the rooms didn't have toilets. So it's not just about fancy technology, it can be about architecture as well. So huge success coming out of this place. It was about a nurse who was plugged in. It was about a surgeon and a chief nursing officer who as a group were plugged in. And it was about a hospital, an entire organization that said, well, we're not certain, but we'll let you test it. We'll let you experiment because we know you have good statistical tests and things like that. And when you have the data, we'll make a decision based on evidence. They made the, the step, and now they're known as one of the most successful cardiac care units around. So you want to go there if you can. So we had three dimensions, the people, the technology, the organizational process. We also had three practices, and these are three practices that we've been able to identify over and over and over again. So I'm going to step through those now. 
All right, the first one. Stop, look, listen. So this is the piece of reflection. Like little kids. Little kids in all cultures learn before you cross the street, you stop, you look, you listen. You, you take a moment, right? You take a moment. In the Providence case, Nurse Judy is walking around, and it's just hitting her that this isn't right. And so they all take a moment. They take the moment to go check out what other people are doing and find out what the options are. So what are your possible options across your three dimensions? And then once you take that first step, listen for the outcome. So that was what they were doing with their evidence-based management. Now in the case of the TSA, and again, I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper. So I'm just doing this as an outsider right now. I just can't believe that they truly reflected on especially two Thanksgivings ago when there was all the talk about, you know, let's boycott, let's do all these things. I don't think they reflected on how this position is just like that position and the implications and how people would feel about being put in that position. These guys, on the other hand, Pixar, they've over and over again spent a fortune because they were willing to stop. Now you think about most movie studios, they've got a, a schedule, they're gonna crank through that schedule and they're gonna do it because it's costing them a lot of money. Pixar, when things aren't going the way they think they should, they put on the brakes. They may switch directors. They may redo an entire storyline but they are willing to have that stop, look, listen moment and be a little bit reflective before they take that next step. And as a result, they've been incredibly successful. Mixing is the second practice of a plugged in manager. And I like to show this one. I have to give credit to a friend of mine who writes cookbooks. And she says, well, when you talk about mixing, it's like, it's like the ingredients for a chocolate chip cookie. The ingredients themselves are kind of crummy. Now, you know, I think that chocolate bar right there could actually be okay, but the rest of it is not very good all by itself. It's not good until you put it together in a thoughtful way. And so plugged-in managers have a way of figuring out how to mix these things together. It turns out that if you think you've got good negotiation skills, you probably have good mixing skills. Because in negotiation, we think about the stakeholders, so who are the people? What are they going to need out of this deal? What are the different issues that are on the table? What are the different ingredients? And then how are we going to put these together in a way that people get what they need out of it? So again, negotiation is a business strategy that I think applies quite nicely to the mixing idea. Quickster Netflix. Yeah. They kind of unmixed. Right, so we had, we had a service that we liked. First thing they do is they crank the price up 60%, and people didn't think that was so great. And then they said, oh, well, you don't like that. We'll split it, and we'll have you have to enroll in two services, get two bills, track two things, and know your lists won't go together. They actually disaggregated something that had been kind of useful and got hammered for it. On the other hand, Southwest, with that implementation of a new boarding procedure, they knew they were going to have to go out there multiple ways to reach all the different pieces of their audience. Their website's kind of fun. So people sort of know, even their less frequent flyers, that they want to get on the computer, they want to check in. And they made it abundantly clear that, here's, let me walk you through this boarding procedure. And it's a fun little thing. You kind of walk through it with them. So they mixed it together in a way that made sense, both for their frequent flyers and their infrequent flyers. Brings me to my third practice. This is the last one. This is the sharing piece. And Zappos has kind of got that one down because from the very beginning, and again, this is one of these where I'm going to read, not you guys. Uh, Fred Mossler was one of the founders. So he and Tony Shea, who's the current CEO and one of the early stage manager types, they're working together. They're kind of coding how this website's going to work. And Fred says to Tony, 
you know, what if we gave the vendors the same information that our buyers have? So the buyers are employees of Zappos. They're the ones going out there kind of picking what they're going to be selling. The vendors are the people who are, you know, selling the shoes. So he says, what if we let the vendors know the same thing that our buyers know? And Tony doesn't really respond, apparently, at this point, and kind of keeps on tapping on the keys. And an hour or so later, he stops and says, well, you mean like this? And he had basically created a little internet portal where the vendors and the buyers could go and see the information, see what the orders were looking like, see what all the, the different products were. The idea was it would benefit everybody. The vendors know their product better than the buyers. The buyers each have at least 50 different brands that they've got to keep track of. If they've got 50 vendors helping each one buyer, that's going to be a better deal. So they got help. And so that's one of the pieces of sharing. Zappos also shares with the rest of us. They've got free corporate tours. I've had the pleasure of going on one of those. They'll pick you up at the airport, drive you to their place, give you the free tour, give you a nice bottle of water, and send you on your way. It is a great time. They also let you tour their fulfillment center in Kentucky, or you can do a virtual tour, but really you want to do the live one. It's a lot of fun. It has music. It's, it's really great. They also sell training now. Now, Disney University has been around for a long time, so this is not the newest thing, but they were getting so much pressure for people to learn about how they're managing that company that they said, well, fine, we'll teach you. So they developed a whole piece of the company that is about training other companies how to do things the Zappos way. And you can also sign up for, I think it's $35 a month, um, the Insiders program, and you can ask them anything. So sometimes when I get stuck and needed a new example, I just ask them, and they give me some great advice. So they share because they want everybody to kind of do things in the same mode as they do, because then it makes what they do easier. It means you're going to be a better customer. It means other organizations they work with are going to go smoother. It's going to be great for everybody. So it helps you push that rock up the hill if you're sharing with folks about how you're thinking about managing. So if you're plugged in, one of the things that seems to happen is you also want to share that approach with the rest of the folks in your organization because it'll just then go smoother. You won't be working at cross purposes so much. And that gets us to the, the how. You know, well, how do you, how do you do that? How do you become a plugged-in manager? <sighs> this is one of my fave stories. So this is uh, Earl Lawrence. Earl Lawrence is an executive at the Experimental Aircraft Association out in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. But he wasn't always part of this um, nonprofit organization. He was an you know, aircraft engineer. He was a product manager, and then he moved up a little bit, moved up a little bit. And people had pointed me to him as someone that they felt was plugged in in a very traditional setting. Right, very traditional. This is not a you know Silicon Valley startup kind of story. This isn't Zappos. This is aircraft manufacturing, and yet this guy is plugged in. He told me it's because of how he grew up. I said, well, you know, he told me a story. Right, I did the whole scenario thing with him, and I said, you know, how did you how did you know this? How did you come to understand it? And he says, well, my mom had a catering company. So as you might imagine, the whole time I'm in school, I'm working for the catering company, I'm doing weddings on the weekend, and I'm having to deal with all sorts of people in very stressful environments. The technology is about cakes and cake transport and all of that kind of thing. He said, but eventually it hit me. If I kind of managed the tool makers, managed the model builders, the same way as we had managed those stressed families, things will work out better. It's all about cookies. So he would bring folks cookies and just make sure that things were OK. And he would let the budgets be a little bit looser than they might have been to help them cover up other, other timing issues that they might have had. So he said it was learning to kind of go with the flow, learning the benefit of bringing along some baked goods that really helped him understand the value of being plugged in. Ah, Rhonda Winter. Rhonda Winter is the CIO of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. She's also been, I think, the CIO of the NC2A 
maybe just the basketball piece. Very interesting person, became a manager very early in her career. For her, she says she shares by thinking out loud. And she said she learned at an early age because she was young, she was a woman, a lot of the people who were her superiors were more traditional. And she learned that if she thought out loud, then they often would come to think of the ideas as their own. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. So it was a great strategy for sharing. One of the things I think we all need to know is to give our colleagues the opportunity to do it on their own. So no one in the scenarios that I, uh, that I did ever said, you want a formal training program. Now, I've done formal training programs around this, but no one has ever said in the scenarios that that's the strategy they used. Instead, they said, you've got to let people go it alone. You've got to take the training wheels off, and you've got to let them get out there and get dirty. Give them the chance to fail. And so that was their take on sharing. So I've talked about the three dimensions, the people, the process, and the technology. I've talked about three practices. And in fact, you're already doing one of the practices. Right? You've stopped, looked, and are listening to these ideas right now, and I, I thank you for that. The mixing, I hope you're going to go back into your own organizations and think about how you might mix things in a slightly different manner. And then the sharing piece, I absolutely hope you're going to do. I hope during the questions you're going to actually share some of your own examples. That would be spectacular. And if you do all of these things, three dimensions, three practices, what we believe is you get three outcomes. You get faster adoption to the changes you're trying to implement because people, they, they align better. They're easier. There's less roadblocks, less hurdles. They're easier to implement because you've shared along the way. And that ultimately, we get greater value because we saw those hot companies and those not so hot companies, the plugged in ones had greater value. So I will stop there, but I do want to reiterate it's about the sharing. And if you want to share your examples with us, we are on, our, I think, our third validation stage. Um, we would love to come out to your organization, ask managers to you know, kind of point out, we think these folks are the most of the plugged in, these folks are maybe a little bit less so, and let us walk through those scenarios with those people and actually gather up that data. We love a variety of organizations in that part. Please do share with all of us, and I hope you'll share amongst yourselves.